Well, we're on the subject of change and transformation. This is a great story. I'd like to introduce to you our keynote speaker, Dr. Christopher Smith from Calvin College. He's going to be talking about changing our minds about disability. Now, Christopher Smith is an associate professor of media at Calvin College, and he's an expert in cultural studies, aesthetics, and disability studies. His books include Michael Jackson, Chasing the Spectacle, and The Exile of Britney Spears. And they examine the role of the different body and society of his many essays on art, disability, popular culture, and all aim to make a sense of cultural difference, politics, and artistic creation. He's also editor of Dis Art, the Journal of Disability, Culture, and the Visual Arts. Please welcome to the stage Christopher Smith. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Andy. Yeah, it's always great to follow somebody who makes your voice sound like Jerry Lewis. Um, and so, but, but in all honesty, thank you, Andy. Thank you, Dave Bilkowski. Uh, thank you, Jocelyn, for all of your work. Can we give her a round of applause? Uh, she is, uh, she is a, a tireless uh, worker. You're going to see, uh, Tim, if you can come up and, and help my computer issues up here already. Tim and I have been working on this all night, and of course now it's not working. But uh, I, I, I wanted to... Uh, thank Dave and Jocelyn for asking me to come and talk to you tonight about disability and imagination. Um, in some ways, uh, I and my work at Calvin College as a professor there, uh, I'm in the business of changing minds. Um, I'm going to change Tim's mind about his, his uh, there we go, there, uh, go back, go back, go back, go back, go back. Oh, one more. Come on, Tim. You can do it. <laughs> there it is. Tim, ladies and gentlemen, give him a round of applause. Very good. <laughs> good work. Uh, as I was saying, the, the title of my, of my talk, which I hopefully will be able to show you right now, um, is called Changing Our Minds About Disability. Uh, and I suppose that uh, I'm in the business of helping people change their minds. Uh, I'm a professor of media at Calvin College, as, as Andy said, and I spend a lot of time lecturing and working with students on culture and cultural texts, all the important stuff like The Simpsons and Lady Gaga and WikiLeaks and Facebook and all the FUD stuff, as one colleague of mine once said. Now, I assume that by deciding to attend uh, college, that my students are announcing that they would like to figure out what life means or how life means. They've, they, they have preconceived notions, of course, about media, about art and culture. Uh, and some of those preconceptions are, are good. They're well-rounded, but others aren't. <laughs> and uh, I see my job as, as helping them change their minds, change their mindsets, their imaginations, about what life can be, and in some ways, uh, that's what disability activists do on a daily basis. We are trying to change people's minds about disability. Now, in some ways, this was a very difficult talk to put together. Uh, normally, I'm talking to folks uh, about the history of disability, uh, about ableism, and about the contemporary experience of disability, all of that in hopes of getting them on board. My goal is usually to get my audience to care about issues related to disability. Now, you folks, by merely being here, have already proven that you do care about disability on some level or another. By making the donations, by helping disability advocates of Kent County celebrate the life and work of Mary Kay Hoodhood, you are making a statement about Grand Rapids and about disability. Now that statement, for those of you who are still wondering, right, what you're doing here, here's, here's what you're saying to Grand Rapids. You're saying that disability plays an integral, important role in the life of Grand Rapids. And that I support those organizations that help empower people 
with disabilities so that they might live full, exciting lives in our great city. So your mind doesn't really need changing, or does it? Here's the thing that I need to remind myself all the time. Imagination is constantly changing, reformulating, growing and contracting. Our vision of the world can sometimes change along with the hours of the day. In the morning, we're optimistic, we're ready to go, excited about this city and what we can do in it. But by the evening, we're tired, we huddle under the pressure and despair of pessimism. It only takes one situation, one negative experience to whammo, change our imaginations. Now let me tell you about a time when my imagination was changed. Um, on the screen, hopefully, you're seeing a video of my son and I. And I want to tell you a story about Moses and I and a Sunday that we spent frolicking around Grand Rapids. Moses uh, takes full advantage of the fact that Daddy uses an electronic wheelchair. Uh, he rides along uh, feeling and looking very proud to be the lucky boy who has his own personal transportation system. <laughs> so this Sunday we spent some time at a wonderful accessible playground at Kenoshe School. Uh, some of you might know that, that area. Uh, we traversed through a beautifully paved wheelchair accessible uh, uh, road through the Kenoshe woods and took great new sidewalks on the 28th Street to get some ice cream and then made our way to Moses' favorite place in the world, Meyer. <laughs> now, one thing you need to know about Moses and I is that when we're together, we do a lot of singing. And sometimes we can sing a little bit uh, too loudly for our neighbors. Uh, so as we walked home from the grocery store and were singing at the top of our lungs, uh, we were quite surprised when we got home to find two police officers waiting for us. I thought maybe we were singing really loud. Um, but two, two cops pulled up to our driveway and, and uh, sort of shocked us out of our good mood. Moses went to play with his friends, and a police officer approached me and asked me where I lived, asked my name, seemed to be investigating something. Turns out that some people had seen me with Moses and had assumed the worst. They were troubled by the image that they saw of a white man in a wheelchair and a young black child, apparently screaming, <laughs> uh, actually singing. Uh, the boy, they assumed, was in distress, right? The victim of a possible kidnapping. I explained to the police officer who I was, who my son was, that this was my house, that my wife was inside, cooking dinner, that I teach at Calvin College, I have a PhD. In other words, that I'm not the person I was expected to be. Immediately, he felt terrible. Apologies were made. I shook the hands of the people who uh, reported me, kindly bid them a good day, uh, did not say anything else because I knew Moses was watching, and, uh, and that was the end. Now, as my wife Lisa, who is much smarter than me, has suggested... There were no doubt many layers of meaning in this unfortunate experience. Ones that are connected to gender, race, and class maybe, uh, but of course disability as well. Nevertheless, the lesson tonight that I hope comes through in telling you this story is one about imagination. Not about facts, not about practicality, not even about obvious discrimination or prejudice, but this story is all about the pictures and expectations we have about people with disabilities. Moses and I had a conflict that day, not because of our environment, not because of some inaccessible uh, room or a bathroom or a sidewalk that didn't go all the way, but actually we had a conflict of imagination. The individuals who called the police were using an outdated harmful, and quite frankly, ignorant image of a person with a disability. They were using an image that has been given to them by bad movies, 
bad government policies, and bad public discourse. The image of disability that currently holds power over our cultural imagination remains attached to a mid-20th century picture of a weak, dependent person who does not have a job, lives under poverty or in an institution, a person that has no self-ambition, someone that may, may not be called upon for any cultural or political service, someone who, quite frankly, belongs on the fringes of the cultural mainstream. Bad movies and television tell us that people with disabilities are either angry or heroic. Nothing in between. There's no normal experience of disability on TV. There's no significant disabled characteristic. Disability defines us as deficiency, as unqualified, as an outsider. Now, I should say that there are, from time to time, disability portrayals uh, that deserve our applause. Uh, currently, I think the Michael J. Fox show, for example, uh, is doing a pretty good job of showing us what disability looks like on an everyday basis. A normal family life that lives with, not in spite, of a disability, like Parkinson's. It shows disability as funny, tragic. It shows us as in the foreground or also in the background. It's, it says that disability is important, but also not so important. And it does this all at the same time. But this kind of show is rare. Mostly, what we get are shallow impressions of what people with disabilities actually are. And while I don't have enough time to show you how they do this, I do want to point out this evening that the media, and all types of media, not just television, but movies, uh, newspapers, magazines, novels, websites, advertising, all of that contribute to how we envision one another. They play a crucial role in setting the tone of our imaginations about a wide variety of issues, including gender roles, racial identities, sexual stereotypes, and of course, disability. Now, many of you work with and for people with disabilities. In this room, we have educators, physicians, nurses, rehab technology, specialists, lawyers, business people, all of whom in some way or fashion do good work to help the lives of people with disabilities. Now, in that regard, I think we're on our way in Grand Rapids. I think we're fighting the battle, and oftentimes, we're winning. Technologies of all types, for example, are helping people with disabilities now live very productive lives. The iPhone alone, in many aspects, has revolutionized my own personal life. It's given me a sense of independence I've never known before. My iPad has helped me, in insurmountable ways, become a better teacher, a better researcher, even a better dad. I can now read Dr. Seuss with ease on my Kindle, on my iPad with Moses. And no, by the way, I don't work for Apple. Um, <laughs> they aren't underwriting this talk, although if they would, um, I'm open to that. <laughs> now, add to these technologies um, of new media the advances in, say, wheelchair engineering, or prosthetics, learning curriculums, hearing aids, right? We might dare to be optimistic about how disability is being experienced in the 21st century. But here's the truth. While we have made strides in terms of practicality, I would argue that we still fall short as a culture, even in Grand Rapids, in our visions of and expectations for people with disabilities. In the world of things, People with disabilities are thriving. In the world of ideas, disability is still tainted by impressions of difference, confusion, and fear. So that's what faces us. A battle over the perception of people with disabilities. A struggle over how disability makes sense. Because everything people with disability try to do in their community 
in their grocery stores, on the bus, in my college classroom, all of that is affected both positively and negatively by perceptions and expectations. And, pers and, and obviously perception and expectations are very tightly linked. If people have a negative perception of people with disabilities, then their expectations of those folks will be minimal and thus damaging. If people think, and I know that they do, that disability is something that only causes anger, then they will treat people with disabilities cautiously, never allowing for authentic relationships to occur. If people define disability as something to be f helped or cured, then they will never expect to be helped or cured by someone with a disability. If people think that people with disabilities don't have full and meaningful lives, then they will never expect to receive joy, humor, intellectual stimulation, conversation, a good date, right, from a person with a disability. If they don't think that people with disabilities are mothers and fathers, they won't expect them to have children of their own. So then it's the obvious question is, what can be done? What can we do about perception and expectations? We can't legislate imagination, at least I, I don't think we can. We can't put regulations on the way people think. If we could do this, America would be a very different place. We wouldn't have debate, we wouldn't have uh, arguments, we wouldn't have discourse or conversations of any type. Right? If we could make people change their minds through the click of an icon on our computer screens or through a new bill in Congress, well then, quite honestly, my work would be done, your work would be done, and we could sit back and relax in a very boring world. But life is complicated and sophisticated, and so too should our responses be. For more than a year now, I've been working with disability advocates of Kent County, colleagues in the world of design and advertising, leaders in several of the colleges in Grand Rapids, key folks in the Art Prize organization, and many others to develop a campaign whose sole purpose is to change the way Grand Rapids imagines disability. The name of that project is Disability Is, and here's its mission statement. We aim to make the experience of disability commonplace by leveraging the power of art and commerce in order to create conversations. Art creates dialogue, dialogue creates community. So soon, we hope, you're gonna start seeing images like this one, designed by my friend Scott Millen from Two Fish Design. We hope we start seeing these images on billboards, uh, advertising in magazines and di newspapers, and on our GR in internet outlets like MLive and the Rapidian. These powerful images challenge us to consider how disability makes its way into our experiences. Disability is all of us. Black, white, married, happy, human. The point here is not that we're all disabled. That would that would really ignore the fact that people with disabilities do not have the same privileges, opportunities, and services that others have. But rather, the point here is that disability is a key part of our human experience. It is, in other words, what binds us together as a community. So while respecting the unique experience of disability, we want to make images we want to write articles, create campaigns, hold events that aim to help all of us in Grand Rapids see that people with disabilities have a lot in common with people who don't. Disability is not to be feared. It's not uh, here to help us feel guilty. It's not here to be a spectacle. Rather, we must in some ways deflate these powerful emotional reactions to physical and mental difference. Disability is will remind us 
that people with disabilities like myself are also African American, gay and lesbian, transgendered, rich, poor, middle class, Democrats, some Republicans, teachers, <laughs> teachers and students, business women, manual laborers, and, and so forth. Consequently, disability is will help make people reimagine their understanding of community, dialogue, and social commitment. The work of changing imagination is something that we all have to do together. Right? This work will not be done from the top down. Dave Blokowski will not give us the answer. Right? We won't get the final word from disability advocates. We all need to change our minds. We all need to work on our imagination. We need legislators to change their minds about disability. Governor Snyder needs to change his mind about what it means to be disabled. Senators, members of Congress, they need to change their mind. Church leaders, teachers, shop owners, the person working at the mall, at the pizzeria, at the shoe store, they all need to change their minds. And if they don't, if we don't, nothing will change. Imagination will remain stale, as will the progress of any disability rights movement in Grand Rapids. So I invite you tonight to change your mind through conversations that you have at work or at the lunch table, in your homes or at your dinner table, at your jobs and churches around town. Change your mind and change it loudly. Other people need to hear it for it to work. Thank you, folks. Thanks for listening.